um, you're safe. Um, this is the important thing. As long as you're not talking, please keep your microphones muted. Um, otherwise, probably some of our um, helpers will do that for you. Um, the same applies to the chat. So this will be saved after the meeting and will become part of the notes document. So if you ex accidentally paste it in um, or wrote in some sensitive stuff, just let us know so we can erase it. Um, remember, you all, you're all um, registered or during registering, you accepted um, the code of contact for TEPIC. So please, please pol be polite, kind, and inclusive. Um, this session will be a mixture of um, presentations from the community and short discussions. Um, and there are three ways to contribute um, during both the presentations and the discussions. You can use the chat anytime for asking questions about um, some, some abbreviations we didn't mention or other things you didn't understand. Um, our helpers will be watching the chat and throw in any questions that or issues that might, uh, might arise. Um, also, you can just add your thoughts and ideas because everything will be part of the notes document um, at the end of the day. Um, you can also directly edit um, this, this notes document uh, with this um, short URL. Um, and during the discussion parts, you can raise your hand and then we will try to, to call you. And so you can unmute, unmute your microphone and, and talk to, to the group or to, to, the, to the discussion. Um, and again, this is all pretty new for us. So if something's not working as expected, expected please be patient. Um, so first about the purpose of this workshop. So this will be about the, the future um, directions of the BioCase and the RPT um, software toolkits. Um, there will be short demonstrations or short presentations about these tools soon. Um, these um, both tools are pretty aged by now. By case development started um, about 20 years ago. IPT is a bit younger, but both are aging products and uh, the technologies have changed, uh, the requirements have changed. The whole community, the whole domain has changed a bit. So um, both tools need to be replaced pretty soon. And um, before starting this, pro this, this, this task, um, we wanted to make sure to involve um, as many people from the community to voice their opinions um, on this future directions these tools might take. And this is what this workshop is about. It um, is only the start of um, this process of gathering um, com um, opinions from the community. And um, we do this with this um, set of presentations to initiate thoughts and then um, some discussions. Um, and then there will be um, a discussion in, in an online forum, but at the end, there will be a summary document um, that's trying to, to compile most of the, or many of the ideas that um, came up in this um, process and that can be used to shape um, the future part of, of these tools. Um, very important, um, no decisions are to be made during this workshop. So if people are not able to participate, they can still voice their opinions later in the discourse forum um, to make sure that it will end up in the summary document. Um, a short um, look on the agenda. Today, we will start with um, some explanations on the purpose and the process of this consultation. Uh, then we have, we'll have um, short introductions um, on the IPT, um, some usage statistics and known issues of the past um, 10, 15 years. And then I will give a small um, presentation from Bike of BioCase, um, mostly on what's the difference between BioCase and the IPT. Um, the largest portions of both days um, will be community presentations. Um, um, followed by small discussions. So these presentations will, um, will focus on certain networks that um, got set up using BioCase or the IPT. 
And people from those communities will tell us about their experiences, um, what worked for them, um, the limitations they hit, and what they would expect from future extension of those tools. Um, today, we'll start with two presentations from OWIS and INVO. And tomorrow, there will be um, another two presentations from the Australian Virtual Herbarium and WordNet. Um, the third presentation tomorrow is not um, about a network that was set up in the past, but about frictionless data, which is um, one of the candidates for, um, uh, for future output formats. Um, and then tomorrow there will be in the second part um, an open discussion, um, some sort of wrap up, and we'll explain how this consultation will go on. Um, about the process of this whole consultation, this is now um, the workshop. So we already are in part two of the process. We started off um, four weeks ago with um, compiling an ideas paper um, that will, will, I, I will show late, um, soon. Um, this sort of serves as a starting point for uh, thoughts and for discussions and also for um, this workshop today. And um, then we will have this workshop, uh, these two days of workshops, um, which hopefully um, end up with um, many ideas in the, in the notes document that you will find again um, in this link. And then after tomorrow, after the workshop, the second day of the workshop is finished, then we will close this um, notes document and we'll um, Go on, the, the discussion will go on in the GBIF discourse forum with the URL you can see. So we will open up um, threads for um, different, on different categories of issues or of, um, of, of, of requirements. So hopefully there will be a lovely discussion on the forum. And once the discussion has ceased or has ended, we will try to compile or to to, to add everything together in one summary document at the end. And this, this will be sent to uh, the various mailing lists. So also at this last stage, you can add your commands if you um, think they're not um, represented adequately. Um, now for the ITS paper that um, we compiled in the past, um, maybe some of you have already um, had a look at it because it was um, um, linked in the in the workshop description. Um, that is basically um, a compilation of all the considerations um, and um, issues that Tim and me are already aware of um, from our past experience with the IPT, uh, with BioCase, and especially with setting up um, different networks um, using these two tools. Um, this is just our thoughts, so any discussion, uh, not uh, during this workshop or during the uh, discourse um, discussions later on, should be restricted. So um, this is just food for thought for you to begin um, thinking about this. So if you have any issues that are not reflected in this um, paper, you're very welcome to raise them and um, just, you can just ignore the paper. Um, I just <clears throat> explained shortly the, um, the structure of the ideas paper. So you see, can see um, the URLs up here. They will also be yeah, written in the, in the chat. Um, of course, it has a small um, introductory section about um, the IPT and, and, and BioCase and their features and what sets the two um, apart. Um, and then there are four categories of um, considerations that need to be made um, when thinking about the future of those tools. Uh, the first is a very basic, um, a very basic considerations like should they be merged at all or do they serve different purposes for different communities and should be kept apart for the future, which could be one outcome of the, of the discussion or of the consultation. Um, if there is one new um, shared product or one product that is, will be the successor of both tools, 
Um, should, be just, should it be just one tool or a set of tools? Um, should it be a traditional software um, that you need to install on an institutional server? Or is it just an online repository like a website? Um, does it need, uh, still need a federated live search? Or should it just produce files for harvesters like GBIF? Should data quality checks be, be included and stuff like that? Um, I can just quickly go to this document. That's it. So can you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is the, uh, the document on the GBF website. Um, you see these three, uh, these four categories. Um, with which I just explained the first one, and you will see the um, different um, sub items of these um, considerations. And um, these are some questions we would like to address. And um, these, um, these categories will also become um, the topics or the threads in the discourse forum. Um, so I just um, rush them through. Um, so the first I already explained, these are very basic considerations um, about the future of the tools. Should they be merged or kept separate? What sort of tools it should be and stuff like that. Um, the second category is um, about um, specific features they should support. And uh, we're aware that um, it's pretty arbitrary for some of the sub items, whether to put them into category one or category two. Um, but um, in, the, in the second category, we put questions that um, affect certain features that you need or don't need in the future, which is like um, is still single record retrieval, which is one of the biocase features um, required in the future or which um, standards should be supported um, by the future tool, um, both ABCD or Darwin Core or the maybe new aligned version or new merged version of both standards, if there should be one. Um, what are the appropriate output formats? Um, do we still need XML or Darwin Core archives with CSV files or is frictionless data um, a better version? What about JSON? Stuff like that. Then um, what are the input formats that we need? Um, the APT is restricted to, or mainly um, focuses on, on flat CSV files, um, biocase on relational databases. Are these two um, requirements that are still used um, or will we need them in the future? Versioning and um, support of incremental updates. So these are rather specific features um, that um, are partly missing, partly already existing. And we would love to know if they um, are required in the future, still required in the future. The third um, category is about integration with networks. So um, if you have those tools or if you have a provider software, and you want to register it in a network um, like GBIF, uh, like GGBN. Um, how do you do that? GBIF has um, a full uh, integration of the GBIF registry, so you can automatically register um, a data set in GBIF, Biocase doesn't. So um, which registries should be um, included in those tools? Um, are there other than GBIF other than the GBIF registry that should be included and could be there's some way of a generic um, registry application interface that um, could be integrated. Questions like that. Then we have the, the issues of um, stable identifiers. Um, GBIF, uh, the RPT already um, has an integration of DOIs. Um, what about ORCIDs? Um, um, ROrs and stuff like that. So are there any other identifiers that we need to um, to address or include? Um, this the section is rather slow but um, uh, rather small. 
um, but probably there are other things we didn't think of and um, yeah feel free to to add them in this in this um, category of considerations and the last um, looks very small in the in the papers document um, but that's probably one of that is open um, the most uh, or we would love to have the most input um, on um, how we do this whole process of changing from existing um, from existing installations to a potential new software. How do we migrate um, existing installations? Um, how do we deal with the desire of users to um, have a stable product and well, to stick what they have? Um, what application frameworks should be used? Uh, what um, languages should be used? And question, questions like that. So this is the fourth um, fourth category of considerations. And we, in this um, workshop, we want to address some of those um, considerations we have on the list um, based on uh, the small presentations from the communities um, that we will do or that um, the presenters will, will, will give us. Um, but again, this is just um, the start of, of the start for thinking. So um, if things are missing, both whole categories or sub items um, that we missed, feel free to address them in the chat or in the discussion. Um, tomorrow there will be um, a longer discussion without any um, structure at all um, or later in the discourse forum. Um, yeah, that's it for the um, sort of introduction and um, yeah are there any questions on on, 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 on this um, purpose of on, on the purpose of, of the workshop or on the process of this whole consultation process or um, how you can contribute Okay, so um, we'll go on with the um, second um, item of the first day agenda, which will be um, an overview of the IPT, um, of the features, um, and uh, some usage statistics. And um, Matt will give an overview or a short recap of um, the issues that have been created on uh, the, the issue list of the IPT in the past. So I'll hand over um, presentation to Tim now. Thanks, Jörg. Um, can I please ask uh, one of the co-hosts to say, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, to both. Super, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to everybody joining and thanks to Tadwig and thanks to all of the people uh, helping to convene this session. Um, there's lots of familiar names in the list. It's great to see you here. Um, the, the, the other Tadwig workshops that we've had have all been related to a specific interest group. And we haven't addressed that in the, uh, the intro here because really the biocase and IPT tools and especially the IPT touch on many of the interest groups across the Tadwig um, community. So it, it speaks to Audubon Corps, which the IPT supports. There's the observation and specimen interest groups, the species information groups. All of those groups have contributed standards that have in some way influenced or are used by these tools. So this is really a, a workshop around tools that cover multiple standards. And because we have people from the IPT community and we have people from the Biocase community, we thought we would start with just giving an overview of the tools themselves. So I, I will start with the, the IPT. Um, I'm Tim Robertson um, from GBIF and I'll be talking along with Andrea Hahn and Matthew uh, Blissett from GBIF. But I would like to, to say there are many people um, especially on this call, who have actually contributed to the IPT over the years. 
So thank you. So uh, a little bit about the IPT history. It was first conceived in 2007 and we conceived it to address data sharing issues that we were facing as we were building the first GBIF index. Now at this time GBIF were only just getting into the game of indexing data in a centralized catalog. Before this um, the community was operating as a federated network um, a distributed set of data repositories that could be queried across the internet. And we developed the IPT alongside the uh, data standard known as the Darwin Core Archive. So we piggybacked on work that was going on in Darwin Core at the time. Um, and the IPT was therefore really the first reference implementation of the Darwin Core Archive standard. We launched with version one, um, in 2008. Now two, version one may not be known to many of you on this call. It was actually quite a sophisticated product. It had a, a mini portal included in it. It included mapping services, search services. It had an API. But what we discovered as we rolled this out across the GBIF community was that it was actually quite a high technical threshold for many people to adopt. And we did some uh, reflection and we, during 2010, we went through a process and redesigned and simplified the IPT. And it was simplified into what's known as the version two uh, product line, which is really where we're still today. Uh, since 2011, when it was first launched, we've gone through a progressive round of incremental updates and evolution, but not drastic change. Now, the paper on the right, um, people on this call have helped uh, write this paper. Thank you very much. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the IPT, I would encourage you to read that paper. So the original design objectives for version two, when we simplified it, I'd like to recap on those because as Jörg said, Version one, oh sorry, category one of our ideas paper is all about questioning or posing the question, are we still, is the IPT still hitting the right kind of needs for the people that are using it? Is the purpose of the tool the same today as it was when we designed it um, back in 2010? So the original outline um, design objectives were that we were building repository software. It was a Java-based software, and Java at the time was the most portable um, implementation that we could, we could uh, strive for. It was intended to be in, deployed by an institution, not by individuals, not by desktop users. It was targeting an institution repository or a repository that was hosted by an institution and shared by um, others. The tool um, would supply uh, user registration capabilities and role assignment. So administration, data manager, and the ability to register data sets on the GBIF network. Trusted users would be able to create data sets. And here's where uh, three of the, the standards that the IPT support come in. The descriptive content, so as you're describing your data sets, that would be documented to the ecological metadata language, the EML specification. Well, it was actually a subset of the full EML, but it was extended with the, uh, the Tadwig Natural Collections Descriptions standard to capture some key elements for the collections community. The data that would come from the IPT was structured to the Darwin Core Archive format. Now, the, the repository would be an internet facing repository, so all data sets would be made available on the internet and data sets could be registered to be included in the GBIF index. And as we include data sets, they would be associated with the organization level. GBIF is an, an organization that uh, requires, an or, uh, it's a network that requires endorsements at the organization level for people to share data sets. So, so the, we are actually quite lucky that many of the people 
who've been involved in the decisions around this are still part of our community. Um, the original developers uh, are still around. The people who've designed the software are still around. So I think we're, we're in a good position that we have a healthy community of users and we still retain the institutional knowledge for how we got here to make good decisions with the IPT going forward. So just looking a little bit at the, uh, the functions that the IPT offers, and many people may never see the administrator functions if they are just a data manager in an IPT. When you're an administrator, you can of course control all the users, you can assign the permissions, and you can control the registration um, capabilities for each user. If a, if a user is allowed to register data sets on behalf of the organization. The administrator, of course, can either choose to register the repository with GBIF or they can choose to, to not register the repository with GBIF and just use it as a, a tool for their own needs. The administrator is responsible for associating the repository with the institutions which will be sharing data through it. So a, the administrator has that control. They can also um, associate digital object identifier assignment on data sets per organization. So that means that they can actually get a DOI prefix for each individual organization that's using the IPT. Now this was something that was uh, sought by a few, but it's not used by many people. And the reason it's probably not used by many is since that was available in the IPT, GVIF has started providing DOIs for all data sets anyway. And of course, the IPT administrators can synchronize and enable the data profiles that will be allowed for data managers within the IPT. So this allows them to say, you can map your data to the Darwin Core Recurrence data profile or the Darwin Core event, sampling event profile, or the taxon profile. And they can also enable the extensions, whether people are to allow the Audubon Core extension for multimedia, or if data managers are, are to share their data to the GGBN or Mixis extensions for DNA-based data. These are the capabilities that only a, an administrator can uh, control. The data manager um, section will be more familiar to, to many of you. A data manager is able to connect the data sources, um, which will be used to prepare data sets. So they can either connect to a database. So this is MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, any relational database that Java can connect to, um, you can configure a pipe into. But you do need to be on the same network um, as that um, database. The tool has to be able to connect to the database to configure that. Or you can upload CSV um, Excel type spreadsheets. You map your data to the Darwin Core and extension um, profiles that have been supported by your administrator. You can document the metadata about your data set. So the people, the sampling methodology, the taxonomic and geographic scope of your data set. You can publish a version. And as you publish versions in the repository, it will archive historical versions and it allows you to provide commentary for the changes that you've made as you publish a new version. You can also enable auto publishing, which is only really applicable when you are connecting to a database. And this is for the use case where someone's connected it to the collection management system that they use on a day to day basis to digitize their specimens. And then every night or every week, they create a new snapshot um, in, as a versioned export. And that's what gets published and indexed in GBIF. It has, of course, the registration capabilities for the data set. And this is where you associate your data set with an organization. And you can invite additional co-workers um, to be data managers on your own data sets. The open access part of the IPT, I assume, is familiar to everybody. Um, this is where anybody can access the, um, the data set. It's visible on the internet. 
and you've got the human readable description of the metadata. So that's in HTML. It's also surfaced as the EML document and it's available as a rich text format document intended to be a stub should you wish to publish a data paper. I don't wish to go into data papers in this presentation, but you can look at that link if you would like to learn more. Of course, you can download the data set um, through the download links, either the current version or the historical versions. Um, it provides the clear citation and the digital object identifier, if that's configured. And if you've registered the data set in GBIF, it provides all the links directly to GBIF so you can see the data. So one thing that the IPT does as well and is commonly used is it allows you to run in what's called a test mode. We originally created this so that people could evaluate the IPT tool itself. So if someone had heard about the IPT and wanted to try it, they could install it in a test mode and play around with it. Over time, this has developed into quite a sophisticated sandbox. The reason it's sophisticated is data that comes from test IPTs can be registered and indexed in the GBIF sandbox. So GBIF actually run an entire mirror of our production system on gbif-uat.org, so user acceptance test. And this allows people to, to build experience with mapping their data, to publish their data in the sandbox environment and see what it's going to look like before they actually publish it for real in GBIF. It's used extensively in training workshops now, and especially in training workshops on uh, data standards and introductions to data standards, because people can see that once they've mapped their data to the standard and learned about the standard, they can then see the result of that on the gbifuat.org um, sandbox. It's also, yeah, thank you. It's also a place where the people who are crafting extensions to Darwin Core can get together and test their, um, their ideas. A couple of slides on numbers. Um, so what you're looking at at the moment is um, the last 13 years of data publication by a GBIF. There's the data, number of data sets added per year per technical platform. You see the years uh, along the bottom from 2007 until now. And at that point, we started to track technical platforms. So the color codes of the columns are the different types of platforms. Biocase, Tapir, Digger, and others. And the height of the columns represents the number of new data sets that are added per year per uh, technical installation type. I should say that this is only data sets that are registered through GBIF. Uh, so we are looking at our registry here. And this is accepting four publishers who have more than a thousand data sets each just for readability. So for example, if you look from the left, uh, third row from the front, you see Digger in red. Uh, in the early years, a number of data sets then dwindling off over time. If you look at the right, uh, you see the more recent years, the orange and the green columns are Symbiota and Earthscape as new emerging platforms. Biocase in the front in blue uh, is going through the whole time. And looking closer to the back, the violet ones, that's HTTP endpoints or data sets served through HTTP endpoints per year. Uh, there are a few spikes in there that uh, need a little bit of explaining. Maybe there's three major regions on that one. The first one is that a few years back, GBIF backed up data sets from endpoints that had gone uh, seemingly permanently offline. Um, we called that the, the um, orphan data set rescue. And we started serving those data sets as static versions via HTTP endpoints. The second reason for spikes is that the Atlas of Living Australia installations actually are not recognized here as their own installation type. 
in the registry of GBIF. So um, Australia and UK would also fall under the HTTP endpoints. And then we have a number of people who create their own Darwin Core archives and serve them through HTTP and register them as such. And then you have the light blue columns in the very back. That is IPT uh, data sets. And I am going to give those a closer look in the second slide. So in this one here, we again have the year at the bottom from 2007 to present day and the number of newly published data sets per year on the um, vertical axis. For comparison, I put also in BioCase protocol surf data sets and HTTP endpoints. I'm not going to cover them any further. It's more to give an impression um, what that looks like. Be aware that the vertical axis of count of data sets is different in the three. The rest is uh, using the same uh, notation. So you have the, the years, then on the vertical axis, again, data sets added per year. So it's not cumulative, it's, it's newly registered data sets. And in this case, now this, the area of the circles represents the number of countries that are contributing these new data sets. So for example, Looking at the left, 2007, we had 250 new data sets registered through IPT endpoints from 12 different countries. In 2019, the second one from the right, uh, you see almost 1,400 new data sets published from IPT endpoints, and those are from 78 different countries in that year. Programs like BID that um, help data mobilization projects certainly had a contribution to that. But um, in total, if you look at the numbers, it's uh, almost three data sets per day that are coming through these endpoints. And I think my the main message here is that IPT is still in quite healthy use and in growth. And we want to look at, um, well, how to make that even better, I guess, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'll just go through some of the issues in the IPT fairly quickly. Um, we've got over 100, 114 uh, currently logged in GitHub. I know there's been some discussion in the chat. Maybe there's some more since I last refreshed the page. Um, I've divided them into about uh, five main categories. Um, so. There's some here that are about the user interface. Um, most of these are about the efficiency of using the interface as well as some small bugs on the, on the metadata. Um, I don't think there's much more to say because they're, they're simply small bugs that we need to handle at some point. Um, the next set is uh, on publication, Tim. The next one's on the publication. Um, and there's a few more interesting ones there because we've got issues where um, people have asked about data quality things. Maybe they could be integrated into the IPT. That's three of the ones that are highlighted. Um, and the second one in the list there, that's a, it says migrating and deleting resources from one IPT to another. Um, so as the network has matured, we see that uh, institutions need to move data sets between organizations to a different institution um, or archive them and bring them back somewhere else. Um, there's some next issues, Tim, on uh, data import. Um, these issues are very old, mostly, so it will be worth us knowing if those are still relevant issues to people or if uh, technology's moved on and it's not required anymore. Many of these issues are about um, bringing in data in different formats or from different types of databases. Um, uh, the next one is on de deployment. There's some issues around deployment. There's not many because I made a recent effort to fix some of these issues. Um, when the IPT was released, I think a lot of people deployed it on a, a Windows server running Tomcat. In the last few years, we've seen more people running it on a Linux server in Tomcat or using uh, Linux 
packages or using Docker. Um, that makes it more complicated to develop to support all of those things, but it does make it easier for the users of the IPT to keep up to date with security releases. Um, so uh, that could be relevant if people still intend to run their own IPTs, knowing what, what, what's suitable there. Um, the next set, the final, uh, the small ones, there's documentation. There's a few sources of IPT documentation. The main one is the wiki within the GitHub. Um, from this, it looks like it's pretty good, that documentation, because we've only got three issues. Um, uh, and I think I should mention here, there's the translations as well. The IPT is available in six languages. Um, thanks to everyone who keeps up to date with the translations. Um, there's, there's a few small issues about uh, confusion, confusing translations or missing translations as well. And then finally, we come to issues about new, new features. These are requests for functionality that doesn't, uh, doesn't exist at the moment, bigger things. Um, Several of these we're going to look at in the ideas paper, uh, but the ones I've highlighted are not in the ideas paper. I think the main one is the, the multilingual data authoring. That's the, the bottom three highlighted ones. So should, should we aim to either use data standards that now support multilingual authoring or extend data standards to support this uh, as well as the tool to allow the IPD to support this? Um, and then the second one that's highlighted, that the one about feature request is LDAP for a password backend. That's the kind of question that uh, comes, uh, depending how people run the IPT, might be the sort of things that large institutions would, would want, um, but might be difficult to implement. So knowing whether there's demand for these is, is useful. So if you go to the last slide, Tim, there's a, there's a link there to the IPT issue uh, tracker on GitHub, um, and particularly for these smaller issues that aren't really ones that we'll be discussing in the ideas paper for the future development. Um, it's worth it. People who need them could give a, a thumbs up on the issue or a comment so we, so we know if there's really demand for them um, or if since something was requested once five years ago and isn't needed, we can uh, happily forget about it. Thank you. That's uh, over to you now. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, um, Tim, Andrea, and Matt. Um, <clears throat> I will now wait. One. Uh, rush through my presentation because we're already running a bit late. Um, I don't want to um, present the biofuels provider software um, in depth. I just want to highlight um, three or four features that set biokiss apart from the IPT. Um, so the first thing is that biokiss is schema agnostic. Um, the IPT is um, bound to Darwin Core. Um, biokiss instead can use any XML-based um, schema. So um, per default, or in, in most cases, it is used um, with the ABCD standard. Um, and uh, with the APCD standard being XML-based, it does not have the restrictions of the star schema that um, the IPT has. So um, in the IPT, in the, in the, in the star schema, um, you can have an, only one to um, many relations between one extension entity and the core, um, the core file, which is the occurrence in most cases. In APCD, you can, have, you can have those relations between other entities than the core. <clears throat> um, so if you want to use biocase with another schema than ABCD or with any um, XML schema you made up on your own, it's very easy. You just create the concept mapping file from the schema description, um, place it in the configuration folder of biocase, and uh, there you go. You need to create the mapping between the schema and your source data, and biocase um, will help you to publish those data in, in, in your self-defined schema. Um, but honestly, this, uh, this approach has never been used. So most users use the default schema or the, the, the ABCD standard, which is the default um, usage of, of, of Biocase. And then certain networks um, extend um, the ABCD schema. 
Um, it has a small um, extension slot where you can plug in any additional um, XML schema. And um, so you have the ABCD standard as a basis and then extend it with um, the data items that fit, don't fit into ABCD per default. Um, that approach has been used by the Australian Virtual Herbarium, uh, which use um, his bit um, as an ABCD extension. Um, Niels uh, will tell us more about this tomorrow. Um, then the, G uh, the, the Global Genome Biodiversity Network um, has created um, the GGBN extension um, of ABCD to share um, genomic data. And uh, GeoCase um, was actually the first extension, I think, um, of ABCD with the extension for geosciences. <clears throat> um, then um, AB, the, the RPT produces Darwin Core archives. So you have to download the whole archive to get the data you're interested in. Um, Biocase instead allows to request just a, simp a subset of, of certain records you're really interested in. So um, you can create a filter on any data item that is mapped um, to the ABCD standard um, using different logical operators. So you could request a Biocase instance, um, or you could um, pose a request I'm asking just for preserved specimens of a certain species in a certain uh, gathered in a certain area. So um, all the type of filters you can apply, for example, on the GBIF portal, you could direct directly um, at a, a biocase installation, and this will just return um, the records of interest. So you don't need to download millions of records if you're just interested in a small subset of, of the data. Um, Using this single record, single record retrieval, um, you can do incremental updates if you want to harvest just, up, uh, just records that have been updated. If the provider um, um, has mapped a date modified, you could just drop by a biocase instance once a week and just um, request the data or the records that have been updated or added. Um, this is done behind the scenes uh, by um, live requests, live SQL statements. So this has the downside, of course, or potential downside of um, performance problems. So if uh, the database is very huge and um, if, the, <clears throat> if there are no um, um, index supporting these type of queries are present, then um, probably the requests take a very long time or will time out. So that's one thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> um, the RPT uses mainly um, CSV files, flat CSV files or flat tables um, as input. Biocase instead can deal with um, whole um, relational databases. Usually these are used um, for collection management systems and um, they have a, a main table that both the specimen and this table links to certain um, other tables for um, the taxa, um, the gathering localities, gathering ages, images, and so on. So in Biocase, you can just set up this structure. You can tell Biocase about the structure and um, Biocase will automatically join these tables together to draw the data into ABCD. So you don't need to flatten out um, the information or the data items that are scattered over several tables. Two minutes. <clears throat> That's perfect. Um, and then, which um, is similar to the thing about um, being able to um, request single records, you can always um, request the latest version of certain records in a, of a biocase installation. So with the IPT, you just produce a Darwin Core archive, which gets then placed on, on, on a server. And uh, with Biocase, you can always request the live um, version of the underlying database, of the underlying um, records in the database, um, which of course could be um, a certain um, a cache table or um, a database snapshot with a certain version. Um, this is, um, you, it, it can be an advantage for certain use cases, but for others, um, it can also be a downside because it, <clears throat> Um, well, there's no versioning control. 
So that's a feature that could be both advantages um, and um, a disadvantage. Of course, um, BioCase has some drawbacks um, and um, things that are missing compared to the IPT. It has no version control, so you always get the latest version of the records um, from, from the underlying database. It has no metadata, metadata authoring, no integration of a registry, so you have to just take the access point of the BioCase installation center to GBIF and ask them to register. Um, the user face is um, a bit aged and um, not uh, very user friendly and pretty complex. So actually you have to deal with the complexity of ABCD to map um, the data items. And it is, since ABCD is XML based, um, the whole thing is XML based, um, which makes it very slow and um, not very useful for huge data sets with millions of records. We do have an um, installation with 10 million um, records using BioCase, but um, that requires quite some time for harvesting and stuff like that. Um, so that was um, uh, the features that set up um, set BioCase apart from the IPT. Um, you can find um, these comparisons um, between the features of BioCase and the RPT also in the in the introduction section of the ITS paper if you if you're interested. Um, yeah, I think we um, we forgot um, the discussion part of the IPT. So we will have a small um, round of questions for both um, the IPT and BioCase. Are there any questions? Okay, which is good because we are already late in time. So I'll open the stage for the community presentations. So remember, these are intended for just um, giving you an idea how certain networks and communities used the IPT. Today it will be just the IPT, tomorrow it will be um, BioCase as well. Um, they will tell us about the experiences and the limitations they met and what they do expect um, of future versions of, of the tools. And the first one will be Peter Provost from the Ocean, Bio Ocean, from Obis, Ocean Biogeographic Information System. Yeah, in fact, we just changed our name to Ocean Biodiversity Information System. Uh, OK. Try to share my screen. Is that visible? Yep, it's, we can see it and hear you. All right. So I'm, a, I'm the data manager at the Ocean Biodiversity uh, Information System. We're part of uh, IOC UNESCO, but uh, the uh, the OBIS team is based in, uh, in Ostend, Belgium. Uh, we have 36 IPTs in our network. Um, most of these are uh, managed by a regional node, but we also have a few IPTs uh, that are uh, that have a global scope and um, focus on a specific theme, such as uh, megavertebrates or uh, deep sea data. Of these uh, 36 IPTs, uh, 15 are running on infrastructure provided by FLIS, the Flemish Marine Institute. So, uh, if a node prefers not to install an IPT themselves, they uh, well, we have a managed uh, solution provided by FLIS. Um, all data flowing into OBIS flows through these uh, IPTs, so we uh, rely quite uh, quite heavily on uh, on the IPT. Um, we use the IPT um, in different ways. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, fully file based. Uh, some IPTs have database connections, and then in some cases, uh, the user interface of the IPT is uh, bypassed, and uh, the data directory is uh, entirely uh, generated uh, programmatically. Uh, first thing I want to touch on is, uh, is the data model. Uh, so for OBIS, uh, machine readable uh, sampling methodology, quantitative data and, and environmental data are uh, quite important because we want to facilitate uh, cross data set uh, analysis, for example, for uh, the essential ocean variables. Uh, 
So these uh, EOVs are uh, defined by the Global Ocean Observing System, GOOSE. And that includes, for example, um, macroalgal uh, canopy cover and uh, uh, phytoplankton environment. So in order to support that, we need high quality and very detailed uh, data. So a few years back, we already uh, started promoting the event core, but we quickly ran into uh, limitations of the, the Darwin Core Archive star schema, uh, which did not allow us to add measurements to uh, the events as well as uh, to the occurrences. So we came up with a, a rather pragmatic uh, solution in the shape of the extended measurement or facts extension. Uh, but we find that this is not always very intuitive for, uh, for data providers. So I think for that, um, for that problem, uh, frictionless uh, tabular data packages could offer a solution by allowing a more flexible relational uh, data model with foreign keys between uh, arbitrary tables. Uh, another challenge that we have is uh, streaming uh, or near uh, real-time data. So I expect in the next few years that we'll get a lot more data from uh, autonomous uh, monitoring platforms. Uh, so these are a few examples. So we have uh, uh, autonomous gliders now, we have buoys and ferry boxes uh, that are all imaging uh, plankton and are generating huge amounts of, of data. So as these files grow, it becomes less and less practical uh, to handle them both at the producer side uh, as on the, the harvesting side. Um, so if somehow we could come up with a, a solution uh, for incremental updates, that would be fantastic, I think. Um, maybe we need something like git for data where uh, the producers only push their changes and the consumers only have to process these changes and not the whole data set uh, with every update. Um, data validation. So um, there's a lot of data validation going on at the data provider and the OBIS node level. Uh, but we still pick up quite a lot of uh, quality issues when we uh, ingest the data uh, into all this. The problem is that uh, at that point, the data are already published. So uh, if there would be a way to have uh, flexible data validation uh, at the IPT level, I think that would be uh, very helpful so that we can give some feedback on data quality before the data is actually uh, uh, published. Uh, I think there are a few options for that. So uh, there's the uh, web specifications developed by Imbo. I assume that uh, Peter is going to uh, uh, talk about that in the, in the next talk. Uh, but there's also the frictionless data uh, table schema. And I believe that the uh, frictionless data uh, Python tooling um, includes a way to, uh, to help evaluate uh, custom logic uh, um, in their uh, validation model. So I think those are all options to maybe uh, have uh, quality control plugins at the, at the IPT level. Uh, IPT and resource uh, registration is uh, still a manual process for uh, OBIS because we don't have the, the integration with the IPT uh, like, uh, like GBIF does. Uh, I'm not sure how to solve that. Um, maybe the IPT could support multiple uh, registry endpoints uh, by using the same uh, API as the, as the GBIF registry. Uh, but maybe a more practical solution would be uh, to allow linking data sets and IPTs uh, to networks in the GBIF registry uh, from the IPT uh, itself. Uh, so that would solve the registration problem for us, uh, but it will also ensure that uh, the network page on, uh, on the GBIF portal is always up to date. Uh, in terms of uh, usability, uh, I have the impression that uh, not everyone finds the, uh, the IPT interface uh, very friendly. So maybe uh, an improvement would be to have a wizard-like uh, interface that takes uh, users through all the steps that they uh, need to take. Um, but at the same time, give expert users um, the option to make full use of the EML. Uh, for example, one, one uh, question that we get sometimes is, uh, is to have uh, the possibility to, to, to enter more uh, detailed geographic uh, coverage with uh, multiple uh, complex uh, polygons. Um, I think that some things could also be managed at the IPT level, like uh, people and keyword sets. Uh, for example, I mentioned the EOVs. If we could, uh, in the IPT, 
um, configure uh, an EOV uh, keyword set. Um, then when people create a data set, they, they could have a pre-filled uh, picking lists to, uh, well, to tag data, set with, data sets with these um, EOV keywords. And then um, finally, um, I think integration with systems like Orchid would be, uh, would be a huge plus. Then I had one final remark on software architecture. I think in the IDs document, there is mention of developing uh, a more module, modular um, tool. And I think that uh, GeoNote does uh, quite a good job. So um, that's a, it's, a, it's a Python Django based uh, application that consists of a number of, uh, of core modules, but, only, uh, but also allows um, uh, the installation of uh, community contributed uh, uh, extensions to, uh, to the core system. So I think that would be uh, perhaps a good module for uh, a good model for um, a future ITP. And one use case I, I see for um, for plugins would be, for example, uh, the support of uh, uh, less common uh, data formats. Uh, for example, we often get the, the question about uh, NetCDF support, especially from people that are used to working with uh, uh, oceanographic uh, data or remote sensing data. Uh, so that could be a community contributed uh, plugin for, uh, for the ITP. And that's it from our side. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much for that. Um, and perfect timing. Perfect timing. Um, I would like to pause to take some questions to the speaker or any comments that uh, people might like to raise at this point. And I'm looking for anybody to raise their hand in the, the chat. Okay, Ben, thank you. Sure. Uh, have there been any drawbacks from the implementation of Java for IPT? Maybe considerations for a different technology. Had you been able to do it again or have things changed over time since you initiated it in Java, maybe that seven, eight years down the line, but like, hey, you know, we really should consider another technology for it. Want a comment, Matt? I would say it's testament to Java stability that we have a project started in 2007 that you can still build very easily in Java. It still runs fine. Unquestionable. Um, There's no question about that one. That, that all works fine. <laughs> um, so in, in retrospect, I think it was the correct choice at the time, and it served as well. Um, we can have different opinions for the future of that, because other tools have caught up. I quite like, I quite like Java because of these reasons. Yeah. Um, but I haven't been the core developer on the IPT. I'm more of the maintainer at the moment. So uh, I, don't, I don't really know if, if we've missed opportunities or so on by having Java in the last few years. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Orwell. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I've kind of switched devices around because my battery ran out of my other computer. So uh, being a heavy user of IPT for years, a um, couple things. Uh, Following on what Matt said, I think having some stability in, in the uh, technology is really important, mainly because there's a, a massive administrative, for large institutions like us, there's actually a large administrative overhead in maintaining it and the security necessary. And you, you, uh, if you don't know, uh, we are, we're, we've, we've been responsible for sending in uh, security issues to IPT to have it developed recently. Uh, another struts, Apache struts vulnerability, just to make people aware, uh, you know, we actually got hacked uh, years ago because of uh, a vulnerability. So uh, there's all, all eyes to our security. So whatever we do, we have to realize that uh, IPT means there's a, there's a cost to institutions to maintain it. I think it's a worthwhile cost, but it, it isn't free. Uh, and it is somewhat complex depending on your system to get things out there. So you can take a very uh, naive approach and say a wizard could help uh, migrate and, and put data in there. But uh, I think that would probably only be a solution for very few. I think it's actually uh, 
you know, the, the complexities of what we do, depending on the data sources, whether we're pre-aggregating data to put into the IBT or whether there's individual users putting separate data sets in, I think we all need to consider. So yes, having something like Java, which is extremely well uh, known and, and can be maintained by a lot of people, I think is important. New technologies come along, but let's, let's tread lightly. Thank you, Thomas. I don't see any more hands up at the moment, so I, I'm actually going to pose a question to the group. Um, in the presentation, Pieter uh, pointed out that they have trouble um, with the registration, that they don't register in the GBIF registry, um, and he says he wasn't sure how to solve that. One of the suggestions was that um, the GBIF registry should be evolved so that people can create networks um, and they can still register in a GBIF registry, but manage their own network and whether the data is to be indexed by GBIF. Now, these are tools to help people build open networks. Is that suggestion something that others would appreciate? The ability to create a network in the GBIF registry establish a network of IPTs, but not have them indexed within GBIF. I don't see anyone commenting on chat or speaking, so I'm going to assume then that this is something that we could work towards with you um, Pieta, for the OBIS needs and make sure we satisfy your network. Um, but I'm not hearing the, the IPT users come forward with a, a big need for their own uh, networks. Falco. Yeah, hi. Um, so speaking for the um, GeoCase community, this would be actually a quite interesting approach as we are um, uh, working hard on um, updating the geocase portal and having so much in, in common with the GBIF infrastructure and even a huge overlap when it comes to fossil uh, um, collection objects um, and object data. Um, we actually also need to uh, um, have a closer look into those providers which would be um, part of the IPT community uh, and, and also provide their uh, geological data uh, to the geocase portal. And so if that leads us, especially in, in this uh, discussion in the workshop today and tomorrow, which I really appreciate, um, to change uh, to a more uh, generic approach, how to harvest the data for geocase. Um, I think as a community, we are open to, to a change of the infrastructure in our back end. Geocase is now only relying on biocase, but if uh, the results of this workshop leads to a, a um, closer collaboration of, of these uh, communities uh, and different infrastructures, that would be quite interesting. So my answer is yes, um, there would be um, an interest, at least from the geocase point of view, uh, to create a community without being directly indexed uh, by GBIF, or at least partially indexed, because the fossil data is still interesting for GBIF, but the minerals and rocks and sediments wouldn't be um, uh, um, of interest of GBIF, but for GeoCase. Thank you very much, Falco. Uh, I've got a question on the chat um, the, via John. Paula via John. Can we hear you, John? I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Earlier on in the chat, Paola brought up, after seeing the graphics that Andrea had shown about the countries that have been brought into data publication, that looking at so many countries and so many data sets and thinking how changes to the technology 
or updates for security reasons and so on happen that the least impact and the least maintenance hassle on the community would be to have in fact fewer IPT installations and so the recent push to have regional IPTs to host for other institutions has been a good one and in VertNet where we have a network installation that we do hosting for but also help to install um, and maintain IPTs for others it Anytime a, a new installation, a new version comes around, it's kind of like, oh, we shake our heads and say, why, why me? Why did we say to do this? So my push would be for fewer installations wherever that's reasonable. Thanks, John and Paula. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I think we should ask Peter um, to give us a presentation. Peter has been a long time IPT user. I think he's one of the first people to use the IPT version 2 across uh, many institutions that have participated in GBIF. So he speaks with a, a voice of experience. Hi all. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. Can you all hear me? We can hear you and see your screen. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm Peter Desmets. I work for the Open Science Lab for Biodiversity, which is a team at the INBO Research Institute in Belgium. Uh, and we have been publishing data to JB for a long time, over 10 years. And before that, I've been a user for, uh, of the I IPT since the very beginning in the Canadensis network. From the IPT we host, from the INBO we host one IPT, which currently has 73 data sets uh, from a number of publishers, uh, but we also publish data elsewhere. And in the beginning it was mostly IPT, but we're now uh, going to more generic data sets, and we publish those on Zenodo, which is a research repository hosted by CERN. Um, we also have data sets on other platforms, including MoveBank for animal tracking data. Um, I'm still very happy with uh, the IPT and uh, I presented this at Canadensis a long time ago that the IPT finally allowed a publication workflow from the very beginning to till having your data set on GBIF, which was very complicated before. Um, but in the interest of time, this presentation is going to mostly present ideas what could be improved in the IPT. Um, for the data, what we do at INBO, we almost never or never use the IPT interface for mapping data to Darwin Core, because generally mapping data to Darwin Core is too complex for the interface. So we have um, data mappings as SQL views or as an R script. The advantage of having this separately is that they can be also documented and versioned, uh, and we do this on GitHub. Um, we also review the mapping of the data. So the mapping is done by uh, somebody in our team and then a colleague uh, will review the mapping and basically check, is this valid Darwin Core? Uh, is this a valid Darwin Core archive? Is it clear to the outside user? And then there's some back and forth on how we can improve the mapping. And is it as agreed? And uh, recently we have been using uh, web specifications, which we developed to allow to document what we expect from a data set and also to have this run as a machine readable specification for the data set. We gave a presentation on WIP in uh, previous TEDWIC meetings and I've included a link here to the um, repository where WIP is um, specified. Um, so what we would allow or like in the IPT that it really supports this iterative review of the data mapping so that you can actually generate the Darwin Core archive without publishing it, um, because this goes through many iterations. And it would be nice that uh, the validation of the Darwin Core archive is some plug-in validation, uh, but for now it is okay to have this outside of the IPT. Uh, but it would be nice if it could be built in and that you can actually see how well your data set or your new version of your data set is before you're publishing it. Then on the metadata, um, yeah, we have been grown to love hate the interface for the metadata editor. There's current there's 12 metadata tabs in the IPD and all seem to have equal importance. And as good documenters, we try to populate everything that we can. 
but it is also a bit of a burden. So uh, it would be really nice if there's a clearer focus on what metadata is actually um, required and what metadata is optional. And we really like the interface in Zenodo where the required metadata sections are um, visible and all the other ones are collapsed. So you know what you should focus on. The basic metadata is basically what you very often see above the fold on a website. It is the title, the creators or the authors, an abstract and keywords and a publication date, and then some technical aspects like the DOI, the publisher, the language, the resource type, which is in this case a data set and the license. This very fits, fits very well with the data site metadata schema, which is a schema uh, that is used to uh, harvest and, and index uh, data sets uh, on the data set site search and where DOI is the data, metadata that is required to assign a DOI. So it would be nice that then the IPT there's a bigger focus on if you fill out these, you're doing a very good job. If you want to do an extra good job, you could actually fill out additional metadata. Um, this is also the metadata that you will see on other platforms if your data set is shared there. For example, our data sets that we published are also pushed to our research um, portal. And the only information that you will see there are the title, authors, and description. For additional metadata, uh, as I said before, it would be good if this is indicated as optional. And for a lot of the metadata, especially the coverage, the temporal coverage, the taxonomic coverage, and the spatial coverage, these can be derived from the data very often. It would still be good to have the option to describe it, but JBIV is, for example, doing a good job in showing the coverage of a, of a data set, so it's not actually required uh, or often required to, to provide this. For the methodology, we noticed that the uh, researchers that we work with if they have to describe the methodology of a data set, they actually prefer to invest their time in doing so in a data paper. Um, for the metadata, as with the data, uh, we uh, collaborate and we review what we write. Uh, most of the discussion is about the author list and the order of the authors and who should be included, the description and uh, some aspects of the methodology. I would say the IPT is better at this than Zenodo. Zenodo there a data set is assigned to a specific user, at least in the IPT as an online tool, you can collaborate, um, but the interface currently makes it not very inviting to do so. So we collaborate in a Google doc and then copy paste everything to the IPT. Again, it would be nicer if the metadata is simpler so we can actually use the IPT to collaborate there. So it is a big question of uh, improving the usability. As been mentioned before, it would be really nice that the authors uh, or just name, affiliation, and ORCID. This is how it is done in Zenodo. To allow reordering of authors, this is a, a big usability issue for the moment. And authors also appear very often on multiple data sets in the IPT. So having to retype all that information is sometimes very annoying. Metadata templates could also be useful because very often the way we describe a data set is structured very similarly. So having a metadata template where you can just fill out or have some uh, boilerplate text that you can then adapt would be useful, as well as seeing the data set status. In Zenodo, if you log in there, you can see which data sets have been published and which have been edited after you have published them. Uh, it would be also useful, especially if you're hosting a large IPT, to know are all the data sets up to date and is there a requirement to republish them. Then on the publication, uh, I don't think IPT should be long-term repositories. That has been used as such uh, since the very beginning. I mean, in IPT1, uh, it was even a kind of a portal where you could search your data set. But this is also makes it a big um, ask to institutions to host IPTs. Hosted IPTs and allowing people to collaborate on a single IPT is an advantage. I think we should have the research repository part of IPTs uh, be done by organizations which actually have this as their mandate. So Zenodo is one which would allow publication of data sets. Data One members have many or listing many repositories, or if that is actually needed, an institutional repository, but that it is not something that comes with the IPT by default. Two minutes. 
versioning of data sets. I really like the versioning, how it is done in Zenodo, where if you update the data, it becomes a new version. But if you update or correct the metadata, it doesn't necessarily become a new version. Each version of your data set has a DOI, and there's also one that is version less, which will point to the most recent version of your data set, which depending on what you want to cite, you can cite a specific version or the version less one. Registration, as has been mentioned before, I would keep, as it is currently, uh, this separate from publication. I really like the single registry that JBF has because it allows to have an overview of all biodiversity data that has been published. But it would be really nice to register with multiple communities. In Zenodo, this is currently the case where you can indicate which communities you want your data set part of. And then the community manager or curator will review if your data set actually uh, follows the community practices uh, for that community and it will then be indicated on your data set to which communities this data set belongs. Um, and these are all the IDs in a very rapid succession that we have for the IPT. There are many more. Uh, it's a tool that we really like to use, um, but I think it could be improved and um, yeah, that we can use things that are out there currently to make it a more modern tool for publishing biodiversity data. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and to Pieter before. It's, uh, it's, it's fabulous to get this deep level of experience presented back to the group. Well done and thank you both for those presentations. Um, I would like to see if people have questions to Peter. So I, I posed a question. Oh, sorry, Josh. There is a hand up. All right, Tim. Uh, so I just had a question about uh, WIP. Um, I was wondering why you're using WIP or why you developed WIP, in fact, uh, rather than using something like JSON schema or uh, there are probably other options out there as well why you particularly decided to go down that route. And the main reason why we developed WIP is um, because we really wanted it as a format to actually test data, but mainly to document data. So in a JSON schema, it is not possible to leave comments. Um, WIP is developed as a, as a YAML schema, but I think it would be really good if we make a connection to the table schemas that are currently existing, so you can actually translate WIP into a table schema, but that it is still a human readable document too. So. Um, it was still at a time when uh, the table schemas were uh, up and coming and we just thought, okay, this is a cool idea. We need specifications for our data set and we want to document them in a machine and human readable way. But uh, yeah, I would really like to make this into a connector to table schema so you can actually just translate your YAML into a table schema JSON file. Thanks, Josh. Um, others actually commented earlier on uh, the idea of integrating data quality um, control into the IPT itself. So I'm distracted by Nicholas uh, coming in with his, uh, his kid. Hey, um, I, do others have ideas of whether they would like to see more um, data quality um, processes embedded in the IPT itself? Or could you imagine the IPT was calling out to external data quality services? So we've got some people commenting on chat, the idea for external ones. Yeah, Tim, I, I didn't really focus on this in my presentation, but I mean, the IPT is a toolbox. So I think it would make a lot of sense to build on things that are already existing and to be able to connect to external ones. Anton raised his hand. Uh, yes, oh, there's, there's a bunch of things uh, that I think are, are quite relevant. Uh, I think with the testing, so we work with, with the Antarctic community and it's sort of a, a mix of, of different expertise in, in, in technology. And, and we try to promote people to uh, actively engage in, 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 in preparing their data sets because we think it makes them better researchers to understand that. 
Um, and then I think it's very useful that they can have a tool within the IPT that does the data testing for them. Uh, because for instance, with the Darwin Core Validator, basically you already have to build a Darwin Core Archive before you can test it. And so if you don't have the expertise yourself to do that, um, then it's sort of complicating uh, that process. So I think having it in the IPT uh, would be a really uh, useful tool. Uh, and then while I have the floor, I think with, with the long-term repositories, um, we have a different set of uh, users. And for instance, there's a number of uh, institutes that act as a general Antarctic data repository. And so they will have the OI act as a long-term repository for that data. But we act as a linkage to GB uh, and Opis, and we do the translation from one format into a Darwin core format um, to make that data accessible. And so for me, that would be very useful. Uh, it's mostly in that frame, and we, said it, we see that that request is coming up more and more so that they have their own DOI, their own uh, pages, but that we translate that to Opis and GBIF. Thank you, Anton. I'm going to read a question from the chat. It's from, there's some fabulous discussion going on. Thank you all for contributing. Uh, David Shorthouse raises the question, has GBIF's governance model dictated what the IPT should do? In other words, why have we not pushed on desktop publishing for individual users? And that's a very, no, I can see people nodding and rubbing their hands. <laughs> hey, Carlos. Um, thank you, David. Uh, it's also something that when Jörg was talking, um, I kind of was, sorry, no, uh, Peter was talking. He's alluding to the idea that it doesn't necessarily need to be an internet facing repository. It's part of a data publishing workflow to shape your data collaboratively, um, to embed data quality processes and then ship it to the, the place where it's intending to go, to Zenodo for an archive or to GBIF, for example. And that's a very interesting um, proposition for us. And it's one that we need to consider quite carefully. So I am interested in as many opinions and constraints as possible that users are working within. Um, we need to know if people have got constraints that their data must reside on their servers, if they have an institutional repository um, obligation to fulfill. And I can imagine that this might vary greatly across the network, but it's one of the reasons why we're opening this consultation to make sure that we do make good decisions that are gonna be um, sort of welcomed by the whole community. So it, it's probably not something that we can uh, cover off today, but we are very keen to hear um, the constraints that people are working within. Two minutes. Okay, I, I propose, is, does anybody have a final question that they would like to, to voice? And if not, we'll introduce what's gonna to happen tomorrow um, and let you all get on with your days. Any brave souls? Apparently okay. not. Yeah. So <clears throat> thank you all for um, contributing and staying um, almost all the time. I see the number of participants hasn't dropped a lot, not below 90. Um, tomorrow, today there, has, there hasn't been much of a discussion. Um, tomorrow there will be more discussions, less presentations, um, and there will be one presentation, uh, one, sorry, one discussion which doesn't have any um, framework um, attached. So um, please come back tomorrow um, if you want to voice your opinions. Um, if you have some time, there's homework for you to do. If you haven't looked at the ideas paper, um, have a look. Um, the link is in the chat. Um, just um, skim it through. Um, it might give you some, of, it might remind you of opinions you might already have. Um, so you can put them in tomorrow. Um, and tomorrow there will be the presentation of um, 
Andre also about frictionless data, which will be um, one of the potential candidates for, for an output format. And uh, the two community presentations of um, Niels and um, David Bloom from NerdVet, uh, WordNet, sorry. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Thanks for joining and um, hopefully see you all tomorrow back. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Can we stop the recording?